My name is Joe Osterly. I'm an artist, art director, writer, uh, cartoonist. Um, and what Sean was saying, I heard, I heard earlier, was like, it is a great idea to meet everybody. You really do want to network if you want to be successful, especially this day and age. And probably mostly because things are changing so fast. I mean, I'm, I'm from, I consider myself lucky in the sense that I've, I've got like an overlap generation. I was in my 20s when the computer kind of started to be in everybody's office. So I remember what it was like to cut Ruby Lip and I heard tales of pikes and things like that. But I mean, there are people who don't know what a pike is, don't care what a pike is, and shouldn't have to care what a pike is anymore. You're right, that's exactly what it is. Well, <clears throat> the reason I had you guys do all that is because if you heard somebody who you think might be able to help you, like Sean was saying, it's all in networking. If you're like, wow, I want to get into web design, you know, I, I forget your name, but Will. Will, maybe Will's the guy to talk to. Maybe Will knows. Maybe Will actually needs somebody. Or, you know, I do, I do flash animation as well, so who knows, you know, maybe, you know, if you, if you, did everybody bring business cards? You should have business cards. Whether you're doing this freelance, part-time, you want to do it, bring a business card. Or, you know, I mean, everyone's got a cell phone now, so it's a little easier. But get a, get a business card. You can get a thousand business cards for $40. They ship them to you in three days. It's real easy to find. There's all kinds of places that do it online. It's, it's a necessity in this day and age to have a business card. Now, and why, and why you want to, like I was saying, why you want to meet other people is because they're going to teach you things. You're going to be able to teach them, them things. I'm an art director currently. Well, let me give you my, my history, my professional history. Um, I started out doing production work for t-shirts uh, back in the late 80s and I, and, and I hated it but I was freelancing during the day and I, and I could do some cartooning during the day and at night I was working and I was separating colors for t-shirts and I was doing a lot of surf stuff about Ocean Pacific and uh, at the time the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were real hot. Um, O'Neill, Newport Blue, I forget that, but it was like the surf scene in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, the, the nighttime position went dead and they brought me in full time as a production artist during the day and I hated it, it bummed me out. I wasn't being creative, I was just doing, I was separating other people's artwork. I thought I was better than them. <laughs> and, and, but it was it was a nice motivating force, you know. It's like I can do this. I can, I'm better than the guy that just paid three hundred dollars for this. You know, give me twelve dollars an hour to separate his stuff. So I went to my boss and said, "Look, I, I, I'm a cartoonist. I can do a lot of the stuff we do in house, and you pay me a salary as opposed to paying the freelance guy." So they thought about it, gave me the job, and just through luck and happenstance, people above me were starting to leave or get fired. <laughs> And, I, and in six months of getting a job for $12 an hour at nighttime, I became the art director of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle t-shirts in, in six months. And it was really a very fortunate thing. I was in the right place at the right time. A lot of this is that, but maybe this is the right place at the right time for some of you people. Um, so what wound up happening is, you know, I can't say that I was the reason, but I was the art director of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle apparel division when the Turtles were the highest selling t-shirt in the world. And I'm not talking kids' shirts, I'm not talking men's shirts, I'm not talking just America. This was the entire, I mean, it was, it was huge and I just happened to be that guy. Now, it was because those Turtles were so popular, but I was that guy. And that helped me along in my career because when they look and they see, oh, you were there during that time. Now, to my credit, I didn't F it up. <laughs> but I kept it on course. I, I hopefully I elevated the brand a little bit. I left there. Uh, the place went under um, because Merrill Lynch bought us out and corporate stuff that I still to this day don't understand. But companies buy you out so they can ruin you and then sell you off to different places. So that happened, and the industry that I was in, the apparel industry, is a very incestuous industry here in Southern California specifically. So I, I knew everybody, everybody went different places and I knew them. Again, you know, it's, it's networking. So a girl that I knew, knew a guy that was looking for somebody. <clears throat> I was cartooning and if you remember Bum Equipment back in the 
early 90s. There was a time in the early 90s where if you went to the gym and you were wearing bum equipment, you know, you were the coolest guy there. About four years later, if you were wearing bum equipment, you were the lamest guy there. But that's the, that's the apparel industry. It's very, very cyclical. And, and, it, and that resonates today, too. Everything is very cyclical. Technology makes things cyclical. Uh, you know, and in a sense, I can long for the days where there used to be guys who, who would render ads in Magic Marker. That was their job. They got paid well for it. And they were at an ad agency for 40 years. Nowadays, yeah, I, I don't doubt it. But nobody does that anymore because even if you need that Magic Marker, that look, there's a, there's a tool for that in Photoshop. So, and, and the thing is, is like, you can't say you're an expert in Photoshop and, and live on those laurels for very long because Photoshop is evolving. And Photoshop evolves and then you have Illustrator and you have InDesign and you get Flash and, and Final Cut. I mean, there's so, in, a, in a way it's great to live in this time because you can, you can learn so much in these, in these creative suites. You can learn so many software programs and hopefully master a few of them and get proficient at others. I mean, the, the, the way I met Sean was, I mean, somebody was saying unemployed. I was freelancing, which is a, a nicer way to say unemployed <laughs> <laughs> at the time. And I, I'd been an art director. I'd been an art director at an at a, uh, ad agency in Newport Beach. It was a nice gig. But I was art directing at a place that uh, specialized in the real estate field. And I walked in in 2005, and I didn't know much about real estate, but I knew it was, it was shaky. And by 2007, I remember I, I walked in and I was the art director of about 24 people. And the day I went, went into my boss's office and said, how much time do I have? I was art directing about six. So, I mean, it, it got to the point where like every three months he was calling me into his office, Joe, give me three names that we can lose. I mean, it, was, it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, single mothers and, and newlyweds and all that kind of stuff. It's an ugly, ugly part of the business. The other, the other reason, so part of that was the economy. Part of that is people undercut each other. You know, that's another, that's a whole other subject. But again, and then that, those, those were the good times where you, you would make three hundred dollars doing t-shirt, and because they valued what you were doing, and they were saying, well, we're making thousands and thousands of dollars on this. We'll give you three hundred. Now everybody has their own computer. Everybody has Photoshop. Everybody thinks they're an artist who has Photoshop. <laughs> So they think that they can do a design and it's worth three hundred dollars, but now the companies are like, "Well, you did it in Photoshop. Give me it's fifty dollars, and I'm not even going to pay you. I'm going to have everybody in the world fight for this fifty dollars." Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. It, it, it gets very That's tough really as a freelance person. It's very very tough now. Uh, a little bit more about me. So I left Bum Equipment. At, at Bum Equipment, I was the art director of the cross license division. So we were doing. Um, Betty Boop and Bum Equipment, Popeye Betty and, and Bum Equipment, Major League Baseball, Football, Oscar De La Hoya. Um, and that was a great learning experience too because you get to do, uh, you, you learn licensing and then when you go to your next job, you know, so I've got turtles and I've done licensing. Now that, that, that's starting to sound pretty good for a guy who's making $12 an hour, you know, a couple of years prior. Uh, I, I, left, uh, I left that place and I started freelancing and I was freelancing in a good period. The 90s were excellent to a lot of people. And I was freelancing, knowing the right people. I was doing a lot of work for Disney, a lot of work for Warner Brothers, a lot of work for Fox, doing cartoons, like Disney cartoons, Warner Brothers cartoons, and making nice money and, and working when I wanted to. It was great, I mean, the, the weird thing, the nice thing about freelance uh, is you can make more money in a week than most people do, most full-time people do, in a month. The bad thing about freelance is you can make less money in a month than some people make in a week. You know, I mean, it's it can be it can be very hit and miss, especially lately. Um, so again, you want to network and you want to diversify. And that doesn't necessarily mean just software. I mean, if you can, if you want to, you want to be a writer. I mean, think about it that way. You're, you're creative people. Don't lock yourself into a box. Be creative about it. I left. I freelanced for a while. I got a job as the art director of the National Lampoon in 1999. 
and that was probably the greatest job I ever had. And it was just really cool because the, the Lampoon was starting to embrace the internet, but I was still doing some print. Uh, I walked in there as the art director and quickly became uh, senior editor as well. I was writing some comedy pieces, we were writing writing things for games on the on the internet. Um, it, it was it was great. It was a lot of fun. While I was there, I contacted an underground magazine called Weird New Jersey. I grew up in New Jersey. It was an underground magazine called Weird New Jersey, and they just had like it was newsprint magazine. It was, they, they only put it out twice a year. And it was just interesting stories, but weird stories about like the local guy who stands on the corner and waves, you know? That guy, or the fact that the gates of hell are literally through a sewer pipe and clipped in New Jersey. Now, as a young kid, I knew that. I don't know why I knew that, but I'm saying, oh, that's right. And then you're reading and you're like, oh, my God. That is right. That, that, cause, and then everybody goes, you know, it's, it's like a coming of age thing. You get through these sewer pipes and, you know, the older you get, the braver you get. But eventually you do get scared and you swear you saw the devil and you run out of the sewer pipe screaming and crying. <laughs> but, um, so I contacted these people and I was working at the Lampoon and I was making a decent living. And I said, look, I really want to be a part of this. They said, well, we don't have a budget. And uh, so I said, that's cool. Just uh, put my website on the thing in, in your magazine. Now, nobody called me. Nobody contacted me in, in, in two years, except for one person, he wanted a tattoo for $25. <laughs> and I, I politely passed on that, but, and, and I was doing all these illustrations for them, an illustration, two illustration, every two years or so. One time they came up to me and they said, oh, Joe, can you get this illustration? And they said, and we're gonna pay you. It was $300, it's industry standard, for magazine work, black and white magazine work at the time, three hundred dollars is probably similar. I mean, that's the about the going rate. So they paid me. They didn't have to tell me. They were really cool about it. I mean, I would have still done it for free because I liked it. But they told me that they'd been picked up by Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble really liked their stuff. They noticed that their little magazine was selling like hotcakes in particular stores throughout North Jersey, Pennsylvania, South Jersey, New York. Um, and they, all they had to do was put a compilation of their books together and, um, and, and, and Barnes & Noble would publish it. They, they'd just gotten into the publishing business at the time. Obviously, they were already retail. Uh, the book went crazy, so they did a Weird U.S. Then they actually had a television show that ran on, it wasn't the channel, it wasn't the Travel or the History Channel, or, which would have made sense. It was something weird. Yeah, it, was, it was the Food Channel or something like that. It didn't make sense that... Weird US was on this channel, I think. But anyway, um, so they were doing well. And it just happened as as, uh, as the Lampoon decided they were going to go off freelance, which will happen. And that's a, another drawback of, of this great technology, is people are going to learn it, and then they're going to think that you're dispensable if you're in-house, because they can get freelance people, and they don't have to pay for medical, and they don't have to pay as much. Um, it's a byproduct. So I mean, embrace the embrace the good of the technology and be wary of of the fact that you can be dispensable. That's why I think you should learn a little more. If you're if all you are is a Photoshop person, if all you are is a web guy, you want to diversify a little. Learn learn Flash, learn Illustrator, learn something you don't want to learn. But if that's learn how to make uh, phone apps, that's really what I want to start to do. Phone, app, phone apps are the way to go right now, and I'm telling you this, and then six months from now, it won't mean anything, you know, I mean, it's going to be one of those things that, yeah, but learn, I mean, if, you, if you're into phone apps right now, come up with a fun game, I mean, the guy who, the company that created Angry Birds is probably doing very well. If you can do something on your own, or with the help of a couple of people that you've met here, because you can draw, and you can program, and you can put it on the, you know, on the, you can put it together as a program, I mean, as a, uh, as a game, you guys may make some money. And if you feel like picking something to Joe, that's cool with me. <laughs> but um, where am I now? Where was I? You. You were probably about Lampoon. OK, yeah. So when, oh, yeah, the Lampoon lets everybody go. And they, uh, Weird New Jersey knocks on my door, and they said, uh, we're writing a book called Weird California. Do you want to write it? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> so it was myself and two other people. 
and one guy was in Northern California, one guy's in, in LA. And I was the guy who just traveled all the way up to uh, Eureka, all the way down to San Diego, just crisscrossed. Whatever I thought was weird, they were cool with. And so I was just going from weird place to weird place, interviewing people, taking pictures, doing illustrations. It was so incredibly cool. Sometimes my girlfriend would go with me, sometimes a friend would meet me there, sometimes I'm doing it by myself. It was all great. It leads, it, it, here's a story, and, and uh, it's kind of cool because I got to tell the story on Kevin and Bean. I don't know if anybody listens to Kevin and Bean in the morning. I got to tell this story on Kevin and Bean, and uh, it's one of my favorite weird stories. But um, I found out that the uh, there was the world's largest rubber band ball, and it was in a it was in like a quickie mart kind of place up in San Francisco in the Mission District. So I would call them before I before I went out. I gave them a call. I said hi, my name's Joe Osterley. I used to work for the National Lampoon. Uh, now I'm working for a, a book. I'm now working for Barnes and Noble Publishing, and I'm doing a book called Weird California. I understand you have the world's largest rubber band ball. I'd like to interview you about that. Which, and I didn't understand the accent. I didn't really know what it was, but I knew the guy didn't care for music. We don't talk about rubber band ball. I think he just slammed the phone down. I'm like, well, now I really want to do this story. You know, I'm very interested in the world's rubber, largest rubber band ball now. So I wait a couple of weeks, and I'm about to go up to San Francisco, and I'm doing other things, and I give him another call and said, uh, hi, my name is Joe Osterley. I know there's two brothers, and I was hoping I got the other one. <laughs> my name is Joe Osterley. I used to work for the National Lampoon. Now I work for Barnes & Noble Publishing. I understand you have a large rubber band ball. I would like to talk. We don't talk about rubber band ball, clearly. So I'm like, all right. I, now I go up to San Francisco. I do a couple of stories around there. There's some pretty cool, obviously, San Francisco's got some weird areas. Um, I, I've got cargo shorts on, so I have a little camera here and I'm about to walk into the place. But right before I walk in, I figure I've got a cell phone, I'll give them a call, maybe they've changed their mind. Joe Osterley, Lampoon, click, you know, so I know they don't want to talk to me. I walk in, and I'm looking around. I mean, it's just this long, narrow place. Uh, and it's right there, I, I missed it, you know. I walk in and I missed it, and then I look at it, and I'm like, I don't know how I missed it, because there's this huge, garish uh, beach blanket. It's like, um, I don't know, it's like all different colors. With a sign on it says, "We don't talk about a rubber band ball." In their in their in their accent, apparently. <laughs> we don't. So I'm like, God, this is this is interesting. But I go down the I go down the hall, I'm feeling very you know kind of espionage-ish, if that's a word. And I take my little camera out and I start snapping some pictures. And then I feel I you know I I, I still want to talk to them about it. I'm in the store. Maybe if I buy something, so I put a butterfinger on the table. I'm like. This is a very strange thing here. I, what is this all about? And the guy starts telling me some stories, but he won't tell me everything. He goes, we don't talk about it because um, we believe we are the world's largest rubber band ball, but other person is, is behind us, and we wait them for Guinness World Book of Records before we tell our story. So I think that's that's a nugget. So I go, I go crisscross all the way down to Huntington Beach again. Then I give him a call. Hello, my name is Mason Brickman. I'm with Guinness World Book of Records. And I understand you have the world's largest rubber band ball. And uh, that was my Davy Jones impersonation, in case anybody. <laughs> that's the one in British person I do, Davy Jones. So, um, yes, yes, we do have a large rubber band ball. <laughs> but then, as we're talking, suddenly he, I don't think he was trying to trip me up. He just wanted to, I, he's like, so what time is it in England? I'm like, shit, I don't, is it six hours, is it nine hours? I, I'm trying to do the math, and I don't know where this came from, but I just said to him, I go, uh, actually, I'm in, because I could do the three hour math to, to the East Coast, I go, actually, I'm in Florida, uh, the world's largest pogo stick is here, and I'm just, <laughs> I don't know, I have no idea where I pulled that one out of, but I did. And uh, so then he, he answered all the questions, and the whole thing was, yeah, there was a competing world's second largest rubber band ball that he didn't want to give the any information. He didn't want to give the diameter, he didn't want to give the approximate weight, he didn't want to give the height, he didn't want to give how many rubber bands are actually built into this thing. Because he knew that other guy, they knew that other guy's hot on their tail. Oh really? Only five more pounds? I can do that to mine. So so he tells I go, and how did you become the world's largest rubber band ball? Oh other other rubber band ball who is bigger than us. They take it up into a helicopter on a morning radio program, 
and they push it out to see how far it bounced. Well, they go to the desert. And I go, well, how far did it bounce? I don't know, that motherfucker blew up real good. <laughs> and now we are biggest rubber band ball. Stop. So that was that story. And as a matter of fact, here's my, here's my latest book, Weird Hollywood. I have a few copies if anybody's interested. And if you are, it's, it's $20. And I will throw in a free DVD from Dennis Woodruff, who is who's featured in the book. I don't know if I'm going to get lucky and pop right to it. There we go. Dennis has got this car, and it's just, it's basically, it's a mobile resume of his headshot, it's what he, what he's, he's an actor, and Dennis, he, he puts a ceramic uh, bust of his head on the car, he just drives up and down Sunset, he makes his own movies, he makes his own movies, he's an absolute bona fide Los Angeles Hollywood character. Ah. There we go. Good. So he, he makes his own movies. This the uh, Dennis has absolutely no budget. If you see two people in a Dennis Woodruff shot, you know that Dennis found a very flat rock to rest his camera on because he can't afford a tripod. <laughs> the beautiful thing about Dennis is he did a movie called Space Man, and that's that's the movie. If if you want to buy this book, I throw in the Space Man movie autographed copy from Dennis Woodruff, and uh, the greatest. Might be the greatest or worst movie in the world. I'll leave it up to you. I love it. <laughs> but he's interviewing. He's a spaceman, and he, he lands on <clears throat> lands on Earth, and and he runs into a woman who's a, a news reporter, a newspaper reporter. Um. So when the newspaper reporter, there's, there's a scene where the newspaper reporter is talking to the spaceman. The spaceman's got a space helmet with a visor and all that, right? So when she's talking to him, the camera's very tight close-up of her, and she's just explaining. Now when, here, here's, my, here's the beauty, when the spaceman is talking, he has his visor down, and he's giving, but you can't, you can't even pay attention because all you see is the actress in the reflection of the visor with this crappy little you know, camera. It's hilarious. There's a, there's a, there's a line in the movie that I wish I could swear that Dennis wrote on purpose. I'm sure it was, I'm sure he didn't. Maybe he did, maybe I'm not giving him enough credit. He comes down, he doesn't understand what procreation is. He doesn't understand what sex is. And she goes, you don't, you don't have sex on your planet? How do you procreate? He goes, on my planet, people grow off trees and we pick them like an egg. <laughs> wow! Like is that is he like six layers ahead of everyone? <laughs> because he would think that everybody knows on his planet that eggs grow on trees, or is just Dennis like that far out? I mean, I love the guy, and I can't recommend. I mean, buy the book if you want, but you don't get the video unless you buy the book. That's <laughs> so the book's good, the video amazing. <laughs> So where are we now? Okay, so now, uh, so I've done, I did Weird California. I went to work for a couple of ad agencies in the meantime. Um, they were having trouble with the, one of the authors for Weird Nevada, Weird Las Vegas. They asked me how close I was. I said, not very far at all. And at the, for, for a while I was on, not, again, freelancing. <laughs> I was freelancing, so every Thursday through Sunday, Two, 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 weeks in a, two weeks out of every month, I was going to Vegas. Or Sunday and Thursday, I'm sorry. Sunday and Thursday. Was just, and I was trying to stay in a different area of Vegas. So I'd stay at the really nice area one time. I'd stay at the medium area. I'd stay way off the strip. And then I'd stay just crappy, crappy dives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's some... There's some <laughs> oh, I've got to... I really just keep telling weird stories here. But there's a, a ghost story. It's kind of... I mean, anybody here believe in ghosts? One. All right. Now you're something to be ashamed of. I don't, I've never seen one. I'd love to believe it. I know people who tell me I've heard these stories. I completely believe that they believe. So maybe some people are just more receptive or more able. They have the gift to see. I don't know. I've never seen it. But I won't dismiss it. Um, does everybody remember the, the TV show Suddenly Susan? Brooke Shields, the actor David Strickland, who killed himself during that show. The show is a pretty successful show, and um, but 
<laughs> he uh, he was dating. He was engaged to Tim Tiffany Amber Thiessen, who was in uh, 90210. And I guess the guy had gotten into some drug problems, and Tiffany said, "If you, if you relapse, marriage is over. We're done." He's in Vegas with Andy Dick, which is <laughs> never a good sign. He's in, he's in Vegas with Andy Dick for a weekend, and there's some NBC junket. And he winds up checking into the Oasis Motel. The Oasis Motel is right across from, uh, what's that big tower? It used to be Bob Stupas. Was it? Strasburg. Yes, exactly. It's right across from, it's a seedy part of town. Um, they advertise, they paint on the side of their building, they advertise, you know, room rates by the hour, so you can tell what the, what the clientele's up to. And then there's this huge field where they used to have those bum fights. You ever hear the bum fights are running? Yeah, it's kind of a seedy thing. This whole field, and it was broken bottles and, and needles and, you know, just bad. Um, so I, I go to this place, and I, I went there at night, and I'm thinking I'm going to pick up some cool mood pictures. And if there's a ghost and he happens to appear in my camera, that'd be cool. But, you know, it doesn't happen, but I'm, I'm taking pictures. A uh, janitor from the grounds rolls around. It's probably about two in the morning. And he, English isn't his first language, so it's a, it's a bit of a barrier. And I, forgive me if I get the room wrong, but I think it was room 201, but I, I mean, I could be completely wrong. Anyway, I go... Anything, ever, any, anything weird ever happen in 201? He goes, oh, I'm, I'm a religious man. He keeps telling me he's a religious man, and, and he apologizes, but he swears there's a ghost there, and he said that every night around 4 to 6 in the morning, again, I may be getting my, my facts wrong, but the spirit is, is still true, um, somewhere between 4 and 6, he hears this high-pitched scream Help me! And then I did a little more research, and that David Strickland hung himself, whatever that time was. He hung himself in that room. Pretty creepy story. I didn't believe the guy was petrified to tell the story. So I go come back the next day or so, and now I've got a video camera in my hand, and I'm walking around the place because they asked me to do some video pickup. I've got a video camera in my hand, and it's daytime, and I think I'm going to get thrown out of this place. And now it's daytime, and, and uh, you know, I park in the lot. My girlfriend's with me. She's in the car. And I park in the lot, and this is that bum lot. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's really seedy at night. In the daytime, like all the ne'er-do-wells go somewhere else because the cops will just pick them off there. So, I, my girlfriend's like, am I going to be okay here? I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's any problem, I'm right next door. Just call my cell phone, and I'll be right back. Okay. So when you're walking around with a video camera in front of you, you can forget that you're even in the real world. Your world is right here. Nothing over here matters. So you're walking around like this. So I, I get up to room 201 and I do a little, you know, scary 3D kind of thing. And then I and then I have my hand reach for the knob, some and I go like this, and it opens them up. Oh. And there's frightening people that stay at this place so, but you know I'm not living in that world I'm living in this world so I'm like, is anybody there nobody says anything so I open up the door and the bed looks like it was either just slept in or the maid came in and crumpled up the things it doesn't look like anyone's in there so I, I fall out again nobody's there so I'm walking around and now I, I'm looking for the beam that he would have put the bed sheet over to hang him it wasn't there so I don't know if they took it out or the, the room is wrong or whatever it was but I, I'm pretty sure the room is right because that was that's what the janitor said and that's what the police report said so they must have taken the beam out I'm going into the bathroom and I'm doing all this stuff I'm completely engrossed I'm forgetting that my girlfriend is in the car you know I'm just like wow this is cool so I go around I pick up some more shots and as I'm, I turn the corner there's this homeless I, mean, I, I don't know these homeless but he looks like a street warrior I mean he's just like desperate looking and he has a stick and the stick is I, I was calling them bump sticks but they were they were like sharpened to a point like a spear and, and people carry those things in that lot so I'm, I'm like this and I bump into the guy and I've got it on my my video camera I bump into this guy who's got a who's got a spear and it doesn't phase me because that's not happening to me it's happening in here. and I, I bump into him I go oh, I'm sorry 
And then he looks at me like he's going to stab me with a spear, and then he realizes I have a camera, and he probably doesn't want anyone in the world to know where he is. I don't know what his backstory is, but he's fallen from grace somehow, and now he's a he's a he's a street warrior with a spear in Las Vegas. <laughs> so he sees me. He puts his head down right across the street. I get to my car that's in the middle of the bum lot and open the car. My girlfriend is decidedly chilly to me. I go, uh, everything all right? And she goes, that guy tried to get in the car. And I go, well, why didn't you call me? Because I did try to call you. I didn't hear the phone, I swear to God, John, I didn't hear the phone. Oh, well, here, let me do it now. So she hits redial. The phone is in my soda holder in the car. <laughs> Which had to scare the shit out of her because you know she thinks that her boyfriend's gonna come to her aid and she calls me and then she hears my own phone. It's a great scene if anyone's gonna do a horror movie. It really is. But that girl's gotta die. I mean, in the horror movie, she's gotta die. So she, to this day, you know, she's gonna see this and not relive it as lighthearted as I am. I will pay for the retelling of this story once again. So I, I, I did Weird Las Vegas. Then. Uh, Left. Oh, as the as the art, uh, I was art directing the, the place in Newport Beach, the ad advertising agency that dealt with um, real estate. While I had that job, they called me up and asked me if I wanted to do Weird Hollywood. I said, Yeah. So I was doing that on the weekend, and of course that job dies, and I, I devote full time to that to that book, and then. At some point, I meet up with Sean because now I don't have anything going on. I wrote, wrote, wrote a book, and Pickens are slim. So I go to Golden West College, and I try to learn Dreamweaver. And and I was learning, and I knew Flash a little bit, but I, learned, I was taking Flash courses thinking I was going to get better at programming Flash. Because I can animate, I can make mouth move, and uh, we can probably find something I did online here that's safe to broadcast. Maybe. maybe. But um, but yeah, so I, I thought like, ah, oh, I, I have to learn web design at least a little bit. And Sean's a great teacher. Uh, I, I did learn a little bit. But that was only because business started to pick up and I started to care less about school because I was getting money. <laughs> but um, so where are we now? So. Uh, my latest project now. I'm now I'm working in an advertising agency in Orange, and uh, I just left the place before that. I was working. Never be ashamed of where you work. If it's money, it's money. I was working at a place that I never thought I never thought I would try to work at, but it was, uh, it was the adult sex toy business. I didn't know what I was applying for. The company was called Sports Sheets, and they said you applied yesterday. Do you remember? Well, I didn't because at that time, if you're freelancing, you're applying for full-time work 25 times a day. So I said, of course I remember you, you know. I only applied to you because you're the only company I want to work for. <laughs> so, I, and, and I assumed sports sheets because I, I think what I was doing is like, I can remember I was like doing, I was, I was applying for entertainment in the entertainment fields some days, in the apparel fields other days, in the advertising fields other days. So I was just kind of like, grouping it that way. So I'm thinking, all right, well, if, if I applied yesterday, that was my apparel day. So, and I, I don't know if it was Craigslist or if it was some job list there, I don't know what it was. But they called me up and I said, yeah, about 15 minutes into the conversation. And she says, oh, you, you're not, uh, you don't shy away from adult themes. Adult themes. And I said, no. And in my head, I'm like, that works for the National Lampoon. You know, we do, we do adult themes. And then I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? You know, because this is, the t-shirt industry, that's what I'm thinking. So now I'm thinking like, what do we do? We do like all day long, I just do mustache rides for free t-shirts, you know? <laughs> is, that what this is? is that what this job is? Because I'm not so proud anymore. I'll take that job. And so I, I, at a certain point it dawns on me, oh, well, I know what this job is. But I went in anyway because they were three blocks away. And it turns out the owners uh, couldn't have been nicer down to earth, really wholesome, real nice people. When I left that job, I had a, I had a, an offer for better money. It was considerably better money, and I was doing okay there. But it was considerably better, and it was in a, 
something that was in advertising, and, and I was, my main concern was I didn't want to get pigeonholed into that industry. Because five years after you're into that industry and your whole portfolio is different dildo boxes, <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to be taken seriously by some. But yes, but you know the nice thing about it is, is I wound up winning awards for my for my packaging design, <laughs> and it was kind of funny because I mean I I looked at what was going on and I decided I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be aggressive. First of all, everybody was designing in purple and green and a big thing, you know. I was like, or, or the girls crying. <laughs> like, well, I don't want to be. I don't want to design those boxes. So I, I, I kind of like. We, I mean, we had a couple of meetings, and we did this thing where it kind of looked like. Um, now I'm, I'm blanking on it, but it was uh, black and white. I'm, I'm sure there's a story here. Uh, David Yerman. David Yerman is the photographer, and, and he. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was really, really high end stuff, and we hired a model, but we treated it all like accessories. So. If they were handcuffs, they were fuzzy handcuffs. I mean, she was. It was like it was like we had her in, in bangles up to her ank up to her elbow. But there was, you know. So I mean, there's always a creative way of looking at a, a design problem. I wound up winning. Oh well, our company wound up winning a number of awards, and I, I really wanted to. I, I told my, I told the owner. I said, I hope one day there's a there's a dinner that I get to speak at, for winning these awards. <laughs> <laughs> because I had my speech prepared, I, I was just going to go up and say, I'd just like to thank the industry for setting the bar so low. <laughs> and then just leave. But, yeah, and then I went to a trade show. It's, it's everything you think it is. I mean, it's like rubber, decapitated rubber heads with their mouths open. I'm like, oh, whoa. And then, and then the t-shirts that they're wearing. A lot more suggested than that thing. <laughs> then I just knocked on the floor because I was scared of it. But and then uh, so, so I left there, and now I'm working. Uh, but while I was there, I got a call. Uh, a friend of mine who was working again, this is network paying off. A guy who worked at at the uh, Hops Herder was the name of the advertising agency I was in at Newport Beach. Um, a friend of mine from there, he was a writer. He called me up and said he was working for Walter Foster. Walter Foster has been doing children's books or how to draw cartoon books for 90 years. You know, you've probably seen them, these big oversized books. And he asked me if I wanted to write and illustrate one of those. And I thought, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. It was really kind of a, a strange juxtaposition, my day job and then my, my freelance job. Because, I mean, one is very much kid friendly and the other is absolutely not. You would think. And so. But that was that was a lot of fun, and um, and now I'm working as an art director at an advertising agency. And seriously, everybody, give me your card because you never know. I may need freelance. I may need to hire somebody. I'll give you my card because you may need a cartoonist, or you may need a writer, or you may. Networking is what it's all about, and uh, I think that's my ending. It's strong. Did I land? Did I stick the landing show? Do I still have more time? I hope not. <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's already. Tell, but if anybody has one story, my favorite story. What, what, what story is this? The monkey in orange. Oh wow! You know what? That is one. Okay, I've, I. You know what? I told you that story right after it was told to me at Comic Con. Coincidentally, uh, I haven't told the story in a long time, and I, I need you to resend me that link. But it's Jerry the Educated Chimp. Yes. Wasn't that yeah? Jerry the Educated Chimp. Now. Since I'm doing these weird books, people come up to me from time to time and say, oh, have you heard of this weird thing that happened? And sometimes, you know, I have, sometimes I haven't. Jerry the Educated Chimp was a monkey uh, who was raised by this man to be, you know, raised like his son. So Jerry would wake up in the morning and brush his teeth, he would comb his hair, he would put his clothes on, he would go out and play or he would help the guy out in the yard. Now this is pre, this is Anaheim pre Disney. Now suddenly all this uh, construction traffic is coming in around this guy's area. Uh, there's all these strawberry farms and orange groves and this guy had a decent amount of land. And it was just him and his monkey <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot of land. And, and, and his monkey boy and um, people are selling. They don't know who they're selling to because Disney doesn't come in and say, hi, I'm Disney, I want to buy your land. Because people will 
jack the price of their land up. But if you're a struggling orange grower or strawberry grower, and, you know, somebody says, I can give you 10 years of income tomorrow, you're tempted. Well, for whatever reason, this man, I don't remember the man's name. Do you remember the man's name? Yeah. I know what he became. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, he became the mayor of Orange, right? The mayor of Anaheim. Mayor of Anaheim. Yeah. So anyway, um, he realized that there was something going on because construction was coming in, and he he thought, well, you know what? I'm not going to sell. I'm going to I'm going to build a bar on my property, and all the construction workers are going to come to my place after they're working on this secret project, and they're going to come back. Now, as he's building the bar, and people are starting to come couple of beers and people were letting secrets slip and now the guy realizes that Disney's got money behind this and he also realizes that they're building a thing called the Jungle Land Cruise so he thinks wow I could, I've already got a monkey I can <laughs> I can build my own little real life Jungle Land Cruise and he starts to get other animals besides Jerry but Jerry he winds up he winds up taking a wall out of his house and makes it glass so people can come and, and look at Jerry during the day and watch Jerry brush his teeth and, and change into his clothes and, and comb his hair. Jerry goes out and he gardens with the guy and he helps, he, he's helping in the construction of all this stuff. Jerry, I don't know how old Jerry is, but he has him from a tiny, tiny baby chimp. And Jerry is probably seven, eight years old now. Disney's about to come in. He's got this thing and, and now he's got, I don't remember what other animals, but he's got other animals. Eventually, he has to like let all the other animals go for you know reasons of biting and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, there there weren't the rules were a little more lax back in you know pre Disney Anaheim. Uh, so what winds up happening is anybody who owns a monkey will tell you you don't want to humanize a monkey because the monkey starts to think he's human and you start to think he's human. But what winds up happening is. Uh, Jerry is out there playing and, and these little kids come along and Jerry, his chips are strong, and Jerry picks up this little boy, throws him up in the air and catches him and throws him up in the air. Now the kid, depending on who you're listening to, kid's either laughing or terrified, you're not really <laughs> sure, but the parents of the child are like, <laughs> So this is this monkey in suspenders, like he looked like Dennis the Menace, he kind of dressed like that, that the striped shirt and the suspenders. <laughs> A slingshot, a slingshot of his pocket. He's thrown his kid. He doesn't drop the kid, but terrifies enough people who saw it that the cops have to come up to the man and says, uh, "You can't have Jerry here anymore." So he's, he's like, "All right, well, uh, you know," and he's heartbroken because Jerry's his kid now. Uh, so he starts to go to different zoos, thinking like, "Oh, they'd, they'd love to have this guy." He's a he can't find a zoo because. Nobody wants a humanized chimp. They're difficult. They, they, you have to, they bring a whole other set of problems. They've got psychological problems from being separated because they think they're children. They think they're, they don't think they're of themselves as chimps. He can't get rid of Jerry and nobody will take him. So one day, a cop comes over, he calls his friend over, he tells Jerry to uh, get a shovel we're gonna do some. We're gonna do some gardening. Uh oh. Jerry starts digging. The cop comes by, and the Jerry's owner. They're just talking, and Jerry's digging a hole. He digs it four feet down, or whatever it is. And the the sheriff of Anaheim at the time puts a revolver behind. Jerry's like going. Jerry falls into the grave. So thank you for letting me end on a high note, Sean. I'll let you in on a better note. What yeah. was the other part of the story about the marketing part with the car? That, 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 I, was yeah. gonna, so I just realized I could rebound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is my favorite part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The orange. It was, he, the guy's like, the, I don't remember, I think it was like, it was right, it must have been right when they were starting the, was it right when they were starting or, or yeah, when they were they ending and it was, or okay. <laughs> so this guy's competing with Disneyland and he needs to get some butts in his, in his park. So he calls all the reporters that he knows, the local Orange County reporters, and says, come down here, you're gonna see something that you've never seen before. Jerry is gonna blow your mind. Gotta come down here and check out Jerry. This trick is amazing. 
So they're like, all right, well, we'll check this out. So they come by, and there's the guy and Jerry. And they're like, well, what's so surprising? What's so, what's so special? It's like, yeah, you'll find out. So they're just talking and talking. And they keep asking him what's so special. And the guy's like, if you want to find out what's so special, follow me. So they walk to the car. Guy gets in the passenger seat. Jerry gets in the driver's seat. <laughs> starts up the car. And they take off from Anaheim. They go to the Orange Circle. And they're, they're driving around the Orange Circle. Everybody's taking pictures and writing it. Now, what he never told anybody is he had a steering wheel under the dashboard. <laughs> But reporters wrote the stories that Jerry drove from, Orange, from from Anaheim to the Orange Circle and just drove around the Orange Circle for hours. So, and then he killed him. <laughs> so, anyway, if anybody has any questions not dead chip related, no, all those go right to Sean. Sean, Sean will handle all those. But if you have any any questions, if you want to buy the book, again, the video work. Twenty dollars worth the, worth the price of the book. I did buy the book. I did missed you? the video. Ah, a year and a half ago. Well, that's a very clever way to get me to give you a free. One. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not asking for a free one. I recommend the book. It's oh, thank great, you very much. Great, thank nice, you. Nice, nice style in the writing as well, and places where cars roll uphill. You know, yeah, yeah, crazy yeah. Stuff. Yeah, Gravity Hill. That's an interesting yeah. thing. I mean, I, I, the science has been explained to me, but I don't understand. I still don't understand it, but. But there's a place, I don't remember where the place in, there's, I think there's two places in LA that do it. I know, I, I remember growing up in New Jersey and there was a very, very significant gravity hill because you're looking at it and you would, like, as teenagers you'd go and you'd, you know, it would be a night of drinking and you know, you'd pour your beard down the hill and it would slide up. <laughs> and then you just put the car in neutral and the car just kind of goes like that. It's the freakiest thing. Now I know it's an optical illusion. All right, at least that's what it's, that's how it's explained. And there are a lot of these gravity hills that cops hang out there because one, they know that drunk teenagers are doing what I was doing when I was a drunk teenager. But you know, it gets to be a point where the people in the neighborhood can't park because everybody is <laughs> is just letting their car drift up <laughs> gravity hill. You used to have something like that at Great Farm. Is that right? Oh well, mystery spot, mystery spot in Santa Cruz is probably is probably all based on that kind of science because the mystery spot is. Yeah. Okay, that is that is my presentation. Well, 